So the topic today, though, is six important leadership skills that every executive needs to develop. Um, I'll give you a, kind of an example of why this is important. When, when I first started the Leaders Institute, folks would ask me, they, they'd find out, you know, we'd be, we'd, I'd be at a meeting, a, a business meeting or something like that, and they would say, well, what is it that you do? And, and it was kind of hard for me to answer that. I would say, you know, well, I teach, I teach leadership skills to executives. And I was I, a lot of times I just get a blank stare back when they would look at look back at me. And sometimes a person would try to clarify and say something like, "Oh, so like time management stuff, right?" You know, or something like that. Anyway, of course, I mean that wasn't exactly what I was doing. And what I realized was that different people have dramatically different definitions of what leadership skills actually are. So, in fact, just for clarification make sure to look at the the soft skills what are they episode that i did a couple of weeks ago it it, it kind of goes into great detail on that but before i get into the the these six important leadership skills let me kind of give you a definition of what they are that way we're kind of all on the same page so leadership skills really are I, I call them the highest level of soft skill these are skills that they're used to inspire others they're used to create a vision for a new path develop skills and confidence of the of the people around us. So basically leaders create past paths that never existed previously. So they're they're starting something new and they're getting people to move in that direction. That's what makes them leaders, right? So these are the six skills and I'll 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 kind of go through each one of them in a little detail and then we'll kind of recap them at the end that way you it makes it a little bit easier. So number 1 is what I call innovation. So, so good leaders share an important common leadership skill. And, and that one thing that most of them have is that they're always looking for a better way to do something. <laughs> like I know, like my team gets absolutely frustrated with me because they, they think I'm never happy. Right? It's like, you know, we go and we do something, we create this great accomplishment, we have this fantastic breakthrough, and then we celebrate it for a couple of days, and then we dissect it and look for a way to make it even better. And so because we're always, when, when we look for ways to make the next generation better than whatever, what it is now, um, that's how we continue to grow. That's how we continue to stay on top and, and beat our competitors, right? So if you and your team are not look are, are not doing this, especially in today's world, then you're likely getting left behind because there's a good chance that some of your competitors are doing that without you. So if you're nostalgic, by the way, a fantastic example of this was in 2001 when Apple released the iPod. Steve Jobs and his team looked at ways uh, to, to make the technology um, of playing music much easier. So if you are alive in the 1990s, right, you, you'll probably understand that was a really big breakthrough. The iPod was this really huge breakthrough uh, because I mean, I, I mean, I, I remember, I mean, I was, I was younger then. So I, that was back when I still did, you know, jogging and stuff like that. In fact, it might've been the last time I actually did jogging. I jogged. So, uh, but I remember, you know, going out and having, you know, I had a CD player with the headphones and everything. And I'd have to go to my CD collection, pick one of the CDs that I had that had enough song, had 15, 15 songs on it, maybe. And uh, one CD that had enough songs on it that I liked because, you know, that it, since it only had 15 songs, not every one of those songs on the album were going to be fantastic. So you'd end up skipping through those things, which is kind of hard to do when you're running and that kind of thing. Um, it also had these, these, triple a batteries that that they were the one battery that nobody ever had you know so it was like stores and stuff so they were always expensive and hard to get so basically the the ipod fixed all of these things um you could actually carry your entire music collection in in your pocket so and then of course they didn't stop there the ipod breakthrough actually led to the iphone um and 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 they made history you know through through basically this this really cool leadership skill, which is innovation, taking something that is not as good as what we want it to be and that we've gotten used to and saying, okay, how can we make that better? How can we innovate? How can we do something different? So the second major leadership skill is collaboration. So when I first started out as a leadership coach or leadership consultant, many of the challenges that I've helped my customers fix were dealt with collaboration. Um, I, I'll give you a really good example. One early client was a truck dealership. 
They, they, um, and what, what they did was they built a competitive environment where the department heads receive bonuses based on the profit of their individual department. Seems like a fantastic idea, by the way. I mean, survival of the fittest, you know, you, you do a better job, you get rewarded for it. And, and um, especially in a competitive area like sales and stuff like that. So, so it, it should have worked, but when the department heads when, when the department had increased um, revenue or decreased costs, you know, then the bonus increased. So if they, if they increase their revenue and decrease their costs, especially at the same time, then they got much, way bigger bonuses. However, after implementing this, this policy or the, these, these policies, the, the general manager saw that the, um, the, the growth of that specific location just slowed down to a crawl. And then eventually it started going backwards. They actually were shrinking in revenue. So the general manager was trying everything to get the location to grow and, and nothing was working. So, um, and in fact, you know, months after he implemented this policy, they, the, the, that particular location began to lose revenue. So when he hired me to come in and say, hey, how can we fix this? What is something that we can do to fix this? As, as I began to look more closely at the situation, I realized what the departments were actually doing, right? I, the, the departments really had absolutely no internal collaboration. They, were, they saw themselves as being individual managers on their own island and in control of their own domain. And they actually seemed pretty adversarial to each other. Yeah, they were cordial, and I mean, they, they were good friends and everything. But the, the it was it was as though they they saw the other department heads as being competition for them. Like for instance, the parts department would would raise if they couldn't really raise customer prices without losing business. So if 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 a if if a mechanic wanted to buy parts from the parts department, they couldn't just jack up the prices on those parts because that mechanic would just go to a different dealership. They'd go somewhere else or order them online, which was becoming more prevalent at that, at that point. However, the service department at the actual dealership, they had to buy parts from the parts manager. So he did, right? So basically, um, so what he would do is he, he would increase the price to the service department of those parts because the service guy could, the service manager couldn't do anything about it, had to buy the parts from him. And that's how he actually increased his bonus. So his bonus went up, service department numbers went down. So to compensate, the service department started to take a real hard line on warranty work for customers, right? So if it was even just an hour past the warranty expiration, mm, no, you can't, no, nothing, right? They weren't going to help out. Um, or if it was something that um, typically they covered under warranty, you know, they would try to start reading the fine print and say, no, nope, no, nope, this is one of those exceptions. You can't get it. So basically it was causing um, a bunch of, I mean, basically disgruntled customers took out their frustration on the salesperson who told them that, you know, this warranty was going to be valid. So both, both sales and service numbers went down even further as a result of that. So um, that short-term bonus actually led to a downward spiral in, in revenue. And I suggested that the manager change the policy. And it was weird because he actually kept the bonuses, but he just tweaked it a little to where the bonus only kicked in if the month over month gross for revenue increased by at least 5%. Or I, I, that's what I recall anyway. It could have been something different, but it was a specific number that was tied to it. And the entire organization had to reach that in order for any of the managers to to um to to get their bonus so and, and it worked like a charm it was it was really effective it, it basically it changed the mentality now to being um it, it was still competitive but it wasn't competitive against each other they, they were being more collaborative with each other and so as a result since they all had the same common goal they were working together to, to make sure that the the organization was succeeding and that's what leaders do. Leaders are able to kind of look at those policies, those procedures, those, those things that we're doing and help their team really collaborate more and better. The third one is vision. This third leadership skill is vision. And, and if I had to pick one of the absolute most important leadership skills, I, I'd probably pick vision. Because in order to create a path that doesn't exist, you first have to be able to see the path before anybody else does. Uh, so, uh, um, by the way, um, I, I did some really cool research on uh, as I was as I was kind of preparing for the episode, and I started looking at Netflix because Netflix is one of those companies that 
is really odd because they they have revolutionized a number of different things as far as entertainment. They, they've totally changed the entertainment industry. And if you grew up like I did with the red Netflix envelopes, you know, you would use the, the they would send the DVD in the mail and that kind of thing. But there's some folks that are listening to this going, what the heck are you talking about? Netflix is the online virtual thing, right? Um, no, actually in the beginning, and they still, by the way, send out millions every you know, every month of, of um, the, the DVDs, I'm not sure who they're sending them to, but, but they still do that. Um, you'll, you'll likely be surprised though, to hear that Netflix actually set out to be a streaming service from the start, like the early late nineties, when they started up, they, their whole goal was to be a streaming service, not a DVD service, not the red envelope company. And in fact, they, they created the circumstances. I, I think anyway, they created the circumstances for the demise of that DVD industry. Um, I, and one of the articles that I read was in Variety and, and it quoted the Netflix founder, um, Reed Hastings. And the, it basically, um, he, he was talking about this vision that he laid out in 1999. This was like a decade almost before, before uh, he was able to implement this vision, but he laid it out in pretty good detail. Um, and, and so it took years for that, that vision to actually come true. But basically, this is kind of what he said back in 1999. He said, this is, I'm going to read this. So this is, it, I typically don't like to read things, but it was just so cool that I'm, I'm going to read this to you. So he said, postage rates were going to keep going up and the internet was going to get twice as, as fast at half the price every 18 months. So at some point, those lines would cross and it, and it would become more cost efficient to stream a movie rather than to mail a video. And that's when we get in. So basically, in 1999, he was saying that, hey, this is where the industry is going. We have to wait for technology to catch up and for postal prices to, to go up as well. And when, when it gets more expensive to send one of these things than it is to just download it, and it's easier. That's when we kind of jump in. And that's exactly what they did. It was like 2007, 2008, that time frame that they started doing their streaming service. And, and again, just like the, the Apple example earlier, you know, kind of the rest is history. So the, the, the entertainment industry just kind of changed forever. So he laid out that path in such a clear way, way before anybody else could ever see it. And so that's what got people to kind of jump on board with him. He was able to acquire or to, to recruit um, really high level people to kind of join him on this mission because of the, that vision that he was laying out there. So the fourth skill is motivation. So when you think of motivational speeches, in, especially in movies or in history, there, there always seem to be two really distinct parts. I mean, lots of parts, but two that, that are in almost every single one. The first is that motivational leaders tend to set high standards. So they're, they're, they're setting those standards that, that when, when you hear that standard in the beginning, it's like, oh my God, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm not sure that's possible, right? But they set that, that standard that's really, really high. And then second, they're really optimistic. So they're, they're going to encourage you to reach that high standard. So the combination of those two traits, really, it's, it's contrary to what the average person does. So when people see these two traits in combination in a single person, they really recognize them. That's how, that's how, you know, the, that's how these motivational speakers, they get paid a lot of money to go on because they're, they, they, each one of them has each one of those two things. In fact, if you watch any motivational speaker, they're often going to tell you a story about how the odds were against them. And in that moment, there, there are really two choices that you have. You either give up or you make your standards a little higher and then you fight like heck to, to get to that higher standard. So motivation is, it's the important leadership skill that, that gets your team to move forward when everybody else is, is standing still. Um, and by the way, I'm going to link to a video in the show notes. It was a motivational speaker. Um, his name's Eric Thomas, and he, and he spoke to the 2016 uh, USA Olympic team just before they, they competed. And it is a really rousing speech. And, and basically, it, one of the things that he said over and over again was that when it gets hard, you got to you want to think about three people who you love the most and use them as your inspiration, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then repeat these words. He, he said, repeat these words over and over again, as you're thinking about those people that, that kind of motivate and inspire you. He's, you have to say things like, I can do this. I will do this. 
and I must do this. There's no, I've got no choice now, right? So he's basically using words as a way to help motivate somebody when times get tough, because they're going to, they're going to get tough to keep going, to push on, to fight, to, to move forward instead of moving backwards, to move forward instead of staying still. And that's, that's where motivation comes from. Those are very motivational words. So you can do the same thing with your folks. Be that motivational uplift in your organization so that when times get tough, you're the person that they're relying on to help push them through to, to charge forward in, in those tough times. So the fifth one is creativity. It's the, the fifth leadership skill that's really important is creativity. Cre creativity is really, it's that skill that you use to overcome the obstacle that has been placed in your path <laughs> that the motivation is needed for, right? So, so um, you've got this vision of where you're going. However, something somewhere along the way, the best laid plans will fall apart entirely. And at that point, you're going to want to give up. And then that's when the motivation will kick in and, and you'll make the decision to, to move forward. So at this point, you're going to wonder, um, okay, so now I'm, I'm feeling good about moving forward. Yeah, I want to fight, but what the heck am I supposed to do now? <laughs> Wait, this is, we were not expecting this. This is something totally different than what was going on, uh, than what we thought was going to go on. So what the heck do we do? And this is where creativity will get you to your goal. So for example, we do hundreds of team building activities every year for, for companies really big and small. And, and our clients hire us because they may only organize, you know, one big meeting every single year, you know, their annual meeting or something like that. So it's real easy. If you're only doing this once a, once a year, it's real easy for things to kind of fall through the cracks. So a lot of times they'll hire experts like, like my team to come in because the, the to make sure that these that glitches don't happen. So nothing get nothing falls through the cracks, you know, because we we do these things, you know, three or four or five times a week. So we can we can pretty much we we can we can do them in our sleep. It's it's kind of like a muscle memory a lot of times. So and and in fact, you know how sometimes you'll arrive at your office and and think, oh my God, how did I get here? It, that that muscle memory has kind of kicked in because you went on autopilot, you know, going to going to the office. Well, I got a call from one of my my most senior instructors a while back and and she started it was funny because when she started the call, she said, you are going to kill me. And I kind of laughed and said, hey, you know, whatever it is, you know, we can fix it, you know, because I was using my motivational skills, right? And she said, um, I, okay, she said, I flew to the client location to do one of our mini golf team building activities. So they basically in that activity, they're making a miniature golf course in a, in a uh, banquet hall, which is kind of cool. It's a really neat kind of thing. Um, uh, by the way, they do it out of like food items, like, like macaroni and cheese boxes and stuff like that, then donate it to, to donate the, the food to charity after they're done playing with it. <laughs> so I know that sounds really weird now that I've said that out loud, but it's really fun. But she, anyway, so she was fit. So she's continuing, though. She said, however, on autopilot, I packed all of my bike building gear. The build a bike activity is our most popular charity team building activity, and it, it requires um, wrenches and screwdrivers and tools and stuff like that. So we have a little kit that we, we kind of take with us. And then when we're doing the, the golf course thing, it, it, we bring golf clubs and greens, you know, the, the, you know, felt greens and, and golf course hole, you know, golf, you know, like a uh, mini, mini golf holes and stuff like that. Right. So totally different materials. So she said, I left all the golf stuff in my garage at home, four States away. And my event starts in about 18 hours. Luckily she got there the day before and inside, by the way, when she said this, I'm panicking because that's why people hire us to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen in their event. But I, I kind of calmly replied, you know, um, Hey, you know, you're, you're, I, I think I told her you're, you're the best at the, in the world at doing these things. And she, she is, I mean, she's really, really talented, really qualified. I said, um, you'll figure out how to fix it. And she did. And the client never knew that anything was wrong. And in fact, when, when I, I had her give a report on that, you know, in the in the next um, sales briefing that we have when all of our, our instructors and salespeople kind of get together. And um, and she kind of told us some of the really creative things that she did to make it very professional and make it to where the client really didn't even know that that um, this was different than what it really should be. So that's where the creativity will really kick in. And then the, the last one 
is really close to creativity. It's, it's inspiration. You have to be inspirational to your people. And you know, it's a little bit different though, because once you harness the, the creativity in yourself, the final important leadership skill is to inspire creati- creativity in, in others, right? So the word inspiration, you know, comes from Greek mythology. The muses would inspire spontaneous creativity in, in artists, you know, and a good leader is able to inspire creativity in his or her teams as well. So, um, for instance, back when COVID first hit, our instructors had a lot of downtime. And so many of our, our meeting contracts, you know, that's what we do a lot of, had, had been postponed or they'd been canceled. So we, we figured that this would be a really, really good time to do a lot of those projects that we've really always wanted to do, but we were just too busy to do. So I encouraged the team to experiment with writing blog posts and recording podcasts and creating YouTube videos. And, and, and we actually use Zoom meetings to, to share ideas. And within eight weeks, weeks or so of the time that the lockdown really started was in full force. Um, Candace, who's one of our lead instructors in Las Vegas, she'd actually written an entire book. It took her just a few weeks to write an entire book. And um, basically the in Las Vegas, the, the pandemic caused a huge number of changes in just in, in Las Vegas in general, but the biggest seemed to be in personnel. You know, for instance, bartenders, have and some casinos have been replaced by machines. And so Candace actually wrote a book called Irrawaddy Reinvention. I'll link to that in the show notes. So you can kind of you can you can purchase that if you want to. It's a real it's a really, really fun and interesting book about how to reinvent yourself if you've been forced to change careers, you know, but especially based on things that have happened recently. And so now she travels around the world helping companies help team members who have been downsized because of the pandemic. And and she helps these people really identify their strengths and their skills so that they can use them in a totally different industry in a lot of cases. So the point is, is that I didn't come up with that idea. I just inspired her to get creative. So if you're an executive, you know, basically you want to focus on building these really important leadership skills and and really to grow as a leader and to build a great team, you want to practice these things consistently. So the first thing is innovation. You, you, You have to be the leader to create the new path. Secondly, collaboration. You got to get cooperation from your team members and other people and and get them to to follow you. And then the third area is vision. Have that clear and specific picture of where you and your team are going. The the next one is motivation, you know, because it's going to get hard. And so you got to keep moving forward during the tough times. Creativity is you know, when those obstacles appear, look for ways to move around them, or in some cases, move through them. And then the last one, inspiration, lead your team to higher levels of creativity as well. And if you do those things, people are going to see you as a great, fantastic leader. 